Hey there guys and girls. In this video, we are going to learn about electric circuits. The reason that we would build an electric circuit is so that we can get an electric current. Current refers to the flow of electric charges. You can kind of imagine electric current as kind of being the charge equivalent of a water current, like in a river or a pipe or something like that. We're going to see a lot of analogies between those two examples. The way that we would measure a um, electric current is in a unit called amperes, named after a French dude, and the device that we would use is called an ammeter. We're going to use these in class. I'll show you a picture here in just a second. The symbol for current is I, and its definition is simply charge over time. One amp would be a coulomb of charge per second. So this device is called a multimeter, when we set it to that side, we're going to see these in class, we can then use that device to measure current. When we set it to the opposite side, like over in this area, it would measure something called electric potential instead. We're going to learn what that is here in just a second. So in order to have an electric current, we need to have two things. The first thing we have to do is something that's going to give the charges energy. So we're going to refer to that as a source of electric potential. Electric potential is kind of like a measure of energy. Because the unit for electric potential is the volt, the electric potential is often referred to as simply voltage. We have a bad habit of naming things after their unit sometime. So when we say voltage, that's electric potential. The definition is energy per unit charge, and so that's why a volt is a joule per coulomb. A good example would be a battery. Battery is a way to provide something with electric potential. The other device that you, are tip that you typically use to get electric potential would be the electrical outlets, the holes in your wall, in other words. So if we kind of draw a simple picture of a battery, like the, just the positive half of the battery, um, positive charges will repel each other, and so one positive charge in that battery has a bunch of energy because it's repelled by the other positive charges. They can do work on that charge and push it as long as it's got a path to move. So again, we measure potential in volts, and we use a device called a voltmeter, which is the other side of the uh, multimeter that I showed you a few seconds ago. The second thing that we need in order to have an electric current is a conductive path. Charges can only move through certain materials. We, we call materials that charges can move through conductors. Typically, metals make good conductors. Silver and copper are the two best conductors that we typically can work with. So if we kind of draw a picture, something like copper, charges can actually move around through. So you can kind of think of a piece of copper as being a pipe for electric charges. Whereas something like rubber, the charges aren't free to move. They're basically held in place inside the atoms, and so we call those things insulators. And so you may talk about insulation for a wire. Those things are typically made out of rubber, and those are there because charges can't move through them. And we'll talk about why that might be important later on. So here's a simple analogy. You don't necessarily need to write this down. Um, but we can compare the movement of charges through wires, or conductors, to the movement of water through a pipe. So I'm going to kind of split this in two. I'm going to do water on the left side. I'm going to do electricity on the right side. So an example of how you can do, use water to do work, if you take something like a water tower, water towers are there so that um, water can have gravitational potential energy, that would be kind of like a battery. Battery gives charges electric potential energy. The difference between the two is that there's two sides to a battery, whereas there's really one side to a water tower. That's because there's two kinds of charge, positive and negative, whereas there's only one kind of mass. And so there's a slight difference there. And so if we wanted to make water move, we would try to move it through a pipe. Whereas if we're going to make charges move, we're going to make them move through a conductor. Typically, we would just go grab a wire. 
So we could put something like a water wheel in the path of our moving water, and then the water would turn that wheel. The same way we can put light bulb in the path of electric charges, and the light bulb will cause the filament to heat up, which would then make it glow. There's other devices we could put here instead of a light bulb, like a motor, for example, um, and we'll talk about those things later on down the road. So in the process of causing the water wheel to turn, the water loses energy, meaning it would slow down, and in the process of making a light bulb glow, the charges would lose electric energy. And so we're converting energy from one form to another. In both cases, it would be a form of kinetic energy because heat is a form of kinetic energy, it's the movement of stuff. And so you can kind of think of charges moving through wires as water moving through a pipe, and you can think of a glowing light bulb as being an um, example or analogy to water turning a water wheel. And then in the end, there would be no energy left over because all the energy would be lost to either the water wheel or the light bulb. Okay, here's where you want to start taking notes again. The way that we can measure how well an object conducts electricity, the flow of charge, is through the term resistance. The better a conductor is, then the lower its resistance is. So resistance is exactly what it sounds like, resistance to flow of charge. Um, the way that we define resistance is the current per volt needed to make it move. We give it the symbol R, pretty obvious. And then the unit that we use to measure resistance is called the ohm, named after a dude named ohm. The symbol is kind of like a beat-up horseshoe. That's actually the Greek letter omega. And so you may see that on devices like stereo speakers. It's a measure of current per volt. So when you put them in a circuit, resistors are going to do two things. Number one, they're going to reduce the current. The bigger the resistance is, the smaller the current. And so there's a direct relationship. The current is equal to the voltage, so bigger voltage, more current, over the resistance. Bigger resistance, smaller current. This relationship is typically referred to as Ohm's Law. Well, that's why the unit Ohm is named for that guy. Came up with that law. The second thing that we need, or that a resistor does rather, is it converts the electrical energy to thermal energy. The rate at which this happens, or which you convert electrical energy to thermal energy, is given by the equation P equals I times V. Remember, power is the rate at which energy is transferred, and so the rate at which it's transferred would be power. The amount of energy that's transferred to thermal energy, remember that power is just changing energy over time. And so a light bulb is an example of a resistor because it takes the electric energy, converts it to thermal energy. If we take that P equals IV equation and we um, substitute in Ohm's law, we could rewrite it in two different ways. We can either replace the I with V over R and make it look like V squared over R, or we can solve it for V. If you did that, it would be V equals IR. And then we could substitute that in and make it look like P equals I squared times R. And so there's three different ways to write that equation, just combining this with that. So what does the resistance of an object depend on? It depends on three things. The first thing is just what it's made out of. So we could say the material. Um, and the way that we quantify that is with a term called resistivity. Try not to get resistivity and resistance mixed up. And we can symbolize resistivity with the Greek letter rho. Kind of looks like a curvy P, if you will. The second factor is the length. The longer something is, the higher its resistance. And we can symbolize length with the letter L. Um, and then the third factor would be the width or area of the object. A wider object would conduct electricity better than a skinny object. So to kind of draw you two pictures, let's suppose we have a, an object that's long and thin like that. So that area would represent its width, and this distance would be its length, versus something that looked more like this. 
that was short and wide. So the long skinny thing would have a very high resistance. The um, short wide thing would have a low resistance. You can kind of use again the analogy of water flowing through a pipe. Water flowing through a skinny pipe is not going to be able to move as fast as water flowing through a nice wide pipe. And so you can kind of use pipes and straws as analogies for resistors. So we can kind of like combine these ideas into an equation. We can say that the resistance is equal to the resistivity. And then longer resistors have bigger resistance, so I put that on top of a fraction. The opposite is true of the width or area, and so that would go on the bottom of the fraction. The way that we can communicate to each other what a circuit would look like is through a circuit diagram. There are some symbols that we use so that we're not always having to draw out batteries and light bulbs and things like that. A battery is simply two vertical lines, one longer than the other. The longer end of the battery represents the positive end. Let me draw a better positive sign. And the smaller end of the battery represents its negative end, so like that. Uh, for most things that we're going to do in this class, the polarity of the battery doesn't matter. Like They work either way you connect them. But that's not going to be true for more complicated situations later on down the road. And so just kind of an important thing to realize right now. A resistor, we could draw like that. A voltmeter is just a circle with a V in it. An ammeter is just a circle with an A with it, A in it. A switch, like a light switch, would be like a break in the circuit, so you can kind of imagine that this part could swing up and down, but we only draw it like that. And then a wire is simply just a straight line. When we draw circuit diagrams, we want to try to draw these things so that they're as easy to understand as possible. So the convention is that we draw the wires such that they're perpendicular to each other and that they don't cross. So for example, if we just connect a light bulb to a battery and a switch, there's our battery, there's a wire, connect it to a switch, connect the light bulb to the other side of the switch, and then a Batter, or a wire connected back to the other side of the battery so that we have a complete conductive path. If we were to break that circuit at any one spot, like right there for instance, then it would no longer be a complete circuit and the light bulb would not light up anymore. Same thing is true if we were to open the switch. And so if we open it, we break the circuit, charges can't move through there anymore. So when we connect meters, we're going to use multimeters in class to measure these things. The thing that we need to know is that ammeter, which measures current, has to be connected in part of the same circuit loop as the thing that's being measured. We say that this is in series. So a picture might look something like that. Just connect it so that charges move through the resistor and then the same charges move through the ammeter. And so we're going to connect ammeters in series. And I'll show you guys that in class. Voltmeters, which measure electric potential, or voltage, um, are connected differently. They're connected so that they are across the thing, the resistor, that is being measured. We say that that is in parallel. And so we draw them so that they are part of different loops, so that charges that go through the resistor don't go through the voltmeter. And we'll understand why that has to be a little bit later on down the road. So for right now, let's just jot that in our notes, and when we actually start setting things up, then it'll make a little bit more sense. Okay, let's do a quick example together. Let's suppose we took some random resistor, and we connected to a 9-volt battery, and we measure the current through it with an ammeter. Let's say we measure it to be 0.25 amperes. So let's draw the circuit, and then let's figure out the resistance of this thing. So there's our 
circuit, just a light bulb connected, or a resistor rather, connected to a battery. An ammeter would go someplace like right there, so that any charge that goes through the resistor also goes through the ammeter. And then the voltmeter would be connected so that it's part of a separate loop with the resistor. And so we can find out how big the resistance is by using Ohm's law. Um, so the first thing you might do is like multiply both sides by R to get rid of the fraction. And then divide both sides by I so that resistance is by itself. And then just plug in your numbers. And so you would get something like 36 volts per ampere or 36 ohms. So let's suppose we knew the dimensions of this thing. Like let's say it was a centimeter long and 0 0.006 square meters wide. The question is, what is the resistivity of the material? So like, what is the stuff made out of, in other words? So if we take our R equals uh, rho L over A equation, solve it for rho, we get something like that. And then just substituting our resistivity would be something like 21.6 and then the units left over would be ohms times meter. That would be our unit because the meter squared and this meter would cancel out. Ohm per meter or ohm times meter would be left over. So one thing that you might want to do just before you get to class next time is find the FET circuit lab. It's a little simulator that you can play with, which may kind of help you understand a little bit better. Till next time, ta-ta.